special, uh, it's especially important for you to come when we have a landscape project. Um, especially important for you to come when we have a landscape architect coming to speak to you all and sharing your work. We're very pleased to introduce Rosetta Elkin, um, who is very busy, so we should be grateful that she's taking time out to come and speak to us. She has a practice and works at the Arnold Arboretum in Cambridge and is also the director of the relatively new landscape program at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Um, she is the principal of Practice Landscape, a collaborative multidisciplinary firm specializing in ecological assessments, plant inventories, and research-led landscape design. As of 2022, she's also uh, the, the director of the Pratt Institute School of Architecture Masters in Landscape Architecture Program, as well as being an associate at the Arnold Arboretum. I had the pleasure of meeting the first graduating class from Pratt last fall, and I gave them a tour of Prospect Park, which they have taken as a studio site. Um, so it's really special and encouraging that New York finally has a good, real landscape architecture program. And so we wish you the best in that endeavor, uh, Rosetta. Um, Rosetta's work as a researcher and a practitioner has particular focus on plant life and climate change. She teaches planting design and seminars and advanced the theory of plant life between ecology and horticulture. Among her awards, she received the 2018 Garden Club America, a Garden Club of America Rome Prize. Um, she's the author of Plant Life, The Entangled Politic Politics of Afforestation, uh, 2022, and Landscapes of Retreat, also 2022, Portraits of Climate Adaptation, uh, and Tiny Taxonomy, 2017, a publication that reflects on the scale of individual plants and in practice through a reading of three gardens. Um, she describes her career as inspired by a closer understanding of the climate in relation to how societies represent, respect, and cultivate land. I will quote from her, and then you will hear from her. Um, the endless connections between plant and human life are physically manifest in the landscape, while the practices that unite people in place are entrenched in their relationship to plants. Thank you, Rosetta, and let's give her a kind welcome. you had held up the book, but let me grab up an oh, another yeah. one. <laughs> no, the, <laughs> well, because the interesting thing is, it sounds like I'm oddly prolific to have two books come out in 2022, but um, it was the, well, the pandemic and such and printing, God. Anyway, nonetheless, um, I am going to talk about Landscapes of Retreat because it's the newer, the newer publication just out. Um, and um, actually, you could pass it around so each of you could hold it, look at it, how easy it is. And uh, the, the publisher is in Europe. It's kind of hard to get your hands on a copy. Uh, but the entire book, all of the writing, all of the photographs are freely available uh, on a website called landscapesofretreat.com. So very easy. You don't have to spend 30 euros. You can get it all for free online. So I'm a huge advocate of open source publishing whenever possible. That's probably a good example of it. Um, but this title is very contentious. And so I'm going to try to get into a little bit of why it's called Landscapes of Retreat and also what that means. Uh, which uh, obviously necessitates defining landscape and also defining retreat. Um, I don't know how often you guys think about defining landscape, but it is on my mind a lot. Um, I'm, I'm interested that we're in a landscape architecture field, but I also know that we're inspired by the rise of our field, which used to be called landscape gardening. We're influenced by landscape ecology. We study landscape planning, landscape history, Etc. Landscape infrastructure, landscape urbanism. There's always a modifier somehow, right? Architecture doesn't doesn't get that second word. It's just architecture. <laughs> but for us, there's always this kind of way of of grappling with the term landscape that uh, that contours uh, what we do. Um, and I don't think it's it's given quite enough attention. So that's been on my mind a lot. Anyways, I, I'll, I'll go on. Um, obviously, like when you look at this kind of image, you all probably like pick out things that you recognize and know, and they're they're dry and they're meadowy. 
and we're used to them and they're beautiful um, for, for many, many reasons, uh, plants just are, you'll never be bored if you study plants. Um, the conundrum that I've had, much like the um, term landscape, so really what I'm talking to you about is, sorry, my interest in landscape and why it always brings me to plants, and then when I obsess about plants for a few years, I go back to landscape, and it's just, it's back and forth. Now. Uh, we do study plants often isolated from context, and when we do that, it does uh, a remarkable job of, of highlighting their beauty, but it also removes the landscape itself and the associations we have. That also makes it a little easier to spec plants, to put them on a spreadsheet, to kind of think about them as a binomial and not as a living organism that does all of these things that can be behavioral to some extent that we like and to some extent we don't like. Right? Oh, we want it to behave, but not quite that aggressively. We want it to be aggressive here and spread, but not over there, et cetera. Um, so we do this thing called planting. I started my other, other book, Plant Life, with the line, humans are a planting species. We plant. That's a, and that is very much what we do as landscape architects. Whatever, whatever side of the profession you get into, whether it's landscape ecology and you're, and you're you know, looking at, at, at quantities uh, of forest cover, or you're doing uh, a permaculture garden, you're specking plants. Um, architects don't do that. So when you're specking plants, somebody's going to plant them. And they're going to plant them somewhere. And hopefully it's going to be where you told them to. But asking a question about where uh, is important to what we do, because as you get into larger and larger scales, we spec plants in the hundreds of thousands. We spec, spec plants in the millions at times. So it starts to become extremely um, important who's doing that planting, the hand, and where it's going, right? Because it's totally artificial. It's horticulture. There's nothing ecological about digging a hole in living soil, deciding which plant you want to put in that hole, going and buying it, and putting it in the hole. Maybe inoculation, maybe some fresh soil, a couple of, couple of this and that's. That is a human decision. That's what I mean by humans are a planting species, and we are a planting profession. So I problematize that a lot, but I also celebrate it because it's something that um, I do a lot of. Um, I'm sure we all do a lot of it. But in certain contexts, especially in the context of climate change, where we have landward migration of the shore, we can't plant our way out of it necessarily. Um, and so we have to ask questions back to landscape, right, plant and then landscape, back to landscape that is about change and evolution and how our world is constantly changing. And rather than trying to fix it in place, uh, which planting often does. That's, I think, what the quote that Ethan um, generously shared I'm interested in that space right between horticulture and ecology, right? Because there, it's the culture of plants. It's fascinating. We love it. We want it to bloom, you know, fatter and bud break earlier and uh, be juicier and all of those things that are horticulture. But we also understand the needs of um, our ecologically worn planet and what that does for pollinators and ecosystems and cycles um, that not all horticultural varieties do. In any case, everything I'm talking about, uh, so maybe surprisingly, I feel like I can sum up in this quote. Have any of you read Wendell Berry? It's a bit of a throwback. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's so worth reading again and rereading, and uh, all of his work is freely available on the Wendell Berry Foundation website. So this is written first in 1969, which then you could probably say, well, he's been thinking about this since you know, 1965, and then republished again, 1972. Allow me to read it to you. For most of the history of this country, our motto, implied or spoken, has been, think big. I have come to believe that a better motto, and an essential one now, is think little. That implies the necessary change of thinking and feeling and suggests the necessary work. 
Thinking big has led us to the two biggest and cheapest political dodges of our time, plan making and law making. The lotus eaters of this era are in Washington DC thinking big. Somebody comes up with a problem and somebody in the government comes up with a plan or a law. The result mostly has been the persistence of the problem and the enlargement and enrichment of the government. Odd as I am sure it will appear to some, I can think of no better form of personal involvement in the cure of the environment than that of gardening. A person who is growing a garden, if she is growing it organically, is improving a piece of the world. I find that very inspiring. I, I hope you do too. It's just a piece of this Think Big article. Read the whole thing. Now, the word gardening has a bit of a, um, a friction in landscape architecture. It makes some people uncomfortable. We can talk about that too. I'd love to talk about that, um, but I'm, I'm gonna move on a little bit. Uh, and hopefully you could even see in some of the images why uh, gardening will continue to come up. Because if we're gonna talk about horticulture, we have to talk about who's doing the work. And there are no gardens without gardeners, of course, uh, but there are landscapes without landscape architects. Um, in any case, I've, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll move on, but I've been thinking little for a while um, getting closer to plants, working one-on-one -on -one with plants is really, to me, the best way I, I feel I get to know them. It's the most genuine thing I can do as a designer, especially when you're specking plants in so many quantities over here. It's like you, you have to, sorry, that was a bit louder than I thought, but um, you have to get your hands dirty. And sometimes um, you can do some very extraordinary things with very, very ordinary materials. And that's what this, uh, this whole project was about and continued to charm people. Uh, but in all of my work with Practice Landscape, which is why we call ourselves that, um, we're constantly testing and trying. And we really love to start from seed. And we really love to start small. So this concept that the ready-made landscape can be specced with all of these big trees that from all of these commercial nurseries is um, doing more ecological damage than anything, and it is the most pure form of horticulture we have. So what, again, if we use that, that, that nice quote, how do we move the dial a little closer to ecological? Well, we need to grow plants and not just plant them. It's a very simple distinction. But if you say to your client, well, we're gonna grow that, it's a different language than saying, well, we're gonna plant that, right? Because the plant that means, it's like buying sneakers. You just go get the Nissa Sylvatica and whatever size, you just shop it, you just plunk it in. Our field has not always been that way, but it has become uh, a great deal uh, like that. So some of our projects are very lengthy because of it. You can see this one in, in Captiva, Florida. It's coming along. Um, but we really try to grow plants. And when you ship seed, it's also much better for the planet rather than shipping plants. The longevity is different, the root development is different, the beauty and also the way they change and take over, it really, um, it, it just, you're designing with plants instead of simply specking plants. So that's how we try to work. It takes uh, time. Um, it's slower and we don't mind. In any case, that's also some of what we're trying to do with the Pratt MLA. Um, I think I really admire this program, the program you're in, both for its lineage, its, its heritage here on the campus, but also because you guys actually get outside, you actually engage with materials. Um, you know, these are, these are students that are in Brooklyn and many of them simply haven't had a chance to engage uh, with the living world in, in meaningful ways. So it's a very exciting uh, time to start to uh, incorporate field-based and land-based learning into uh, a kind of overly software-driven uh, field. I am critical of that. I'm critical of it because when I see a student that spends more time in a graphic design program than outside, I, th I think we can do better. Um, and it's up to us. 
So the, a lot of that is the sort of backstory as to where this book, Landscapes of Retreat, came from because it came from a very long research project that actually started post Sandy. Um, and I'll read you another quote and, uh, and hopefully that will help frame it. We have told ourselves that we could live in isolation from other species, not perceiving our connections to the larger world, thinking that we do not have responsibilities and that we are not connected to each other. In the end, time tells us that we cannot escape from our pasts, that indeed we must use our knowledge to reconcile ourselves with our history and with each other. So this history, of course, Winona LaDuke is talking about colonial history. She's talking about the creation of, uh, of reservations. She's talking about the Indian Act. There are a lot of things uh, in this statement. But reconciling with history is also something that we need to do professionally in terms of where our profession came from, where it landed, and where it's going. And it is worth, and yeah, if nobody has read Winona LaDuke, read it. Read all of, all of her work, if, if possible. Um, but those kinds of statements, both her and Wendell Berry and others, um, I'll go through this pretty quickly, were at the heart of this book, which is um, Plant Life, uh, really about where we do a lot of these massive planting program projects, these schemes, these million uh, tree programs, um, and where those plants land and how and why the design professions are obviously implicated. At the root or at the heart of the book is that um, we can't fight deforestation with afforestation. Um, afforestation, which is what's happening here, um, is the deliberate planting of trees in otherwise treeless environments. So biomes that do not support woody plants. So we do a lot of that, we, the royal we, in our, in our, <clears throat> in our world. I, I, I'm not talking about plant life today. I'd love to talk about it another time. Uh, but sometimes I, I, get, I get the feeling that the books seem really separate. And I, I feel like they're actually extremely connected. Um, and so sometimes lectures like this are an opportunity for me to revisit how to frame that connectivity and that reconciliation, frankly, that reconciliation with how we work and the fact that I'm very passionate about the profession. I love landscape architecture. I'm thrilled that I found it. I can't, I, I can't believe <laughs> that I did because it's, it's nice to feel a part of um, a métier that you admire. Um, that being said, we have to bring it into the 21st century. We can't just be practicing like it's the 20th century. Things are changing. Things have changed. And so a lot of our precedents, a lot of our materials, a lot of our histories need to be reconciled in order to move the dial forward into a much, much more adaptive, changeable, and flexible environment, and much less um, um, uh, predictability. And I think that that starts with our relationship with the living world. Um, of course it starts with animals and insects and each other, et cetera. I focus on plants as a landscape architect because, again, because we spec plants. We don't spec animals. We don't spec insects. We spec plants. So of all kinds. We also spec soils. So these are in, this is in our, um, this is, I, I don't want to say control, but it's like it's in our hands. It's in our hands. Um, and so how are we going to do that in the future and do right by some of the changeability uh, in order to address this kind of reconciliation? And I do think a lot of it comes from a garden history that does underlie our profession. Um, obviously, I'm talking to you today about this book called Landscapes of Retreat. And so the image on your right probably starts to imagine this landscapes of retreat that I'm going to get into in a minute. Um, but it ha has a lot to do, it has a, a lot to do with this. I don't even know what want to say what this is yet. But it is 
a political space. The garden is a political space. It's a space where women felt free. It's a space where minorities felt free. Women especially felt free because they could leave the kitchen, leave the house. Uh, many, uh, this is in Harlem, many, many social events by women, organizing events, activist events were not held in the kitchen or the dining room. They were held in the garden. And they were held in the garden because they were felt free there. In any case, that love of place, that understanding of place, that activism, that community building, that exchange, it does happen out of doors a great deal. And we're indoors so much that when we do go out of doors, at times it is hard to read. I'll say hard to read. It's hard to read what's happening. It feels like an affront, uh, a lot of the changeability. Uh, because we're not neither responsible for the housing, the beach renourishment, the paving, the specking of the park that's getting you know eaten away uh, by by tides. We have no personal connection to any of those materials. When change happens in her garden, she knows. When change happens in this garden, nobody's responsible and we point fingers again at a problem, and then the government. When really it's that distance we have from it that um, I will, will ar would argue is part of the problem. Nobody's responsible, we're not responsible. So Landscapes of Retreat is, is actually about communities that decided to move away from vulnerability, from any kind of landscape vulnerability, earthquakes, floods, uh, landslides, tsunamis, and they decided as a community to move away. They retreated. They were not told to leave. They were not relocated by a government. They made a decision in tune with their environment, with their landscape, because they noticed the endless changeability of what they were living with and decided to honor that landscape change rather than try to fight it. To plant it, to pave it, to figure it out. So, in uh, in in the introduction, I basically uh, talk about this this term, a mandatory relations, um, which is how we start to work with other forces, other processes, um, other um, conditions, other than those that are extremely predictable and fit nicely in our frame and in our grading plan. Um, and retreat is 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 that way because it helps us understand um, this changeability and that we have a choice because the communities themselves, of course, are choosing. The, um, the sites that I went to are, were very hard to reach. Um, uh, this is a field work based research and um, it was not, um, it was personally uh, trying, I'll say. And uh, so for instance, this site in Nepal, it took us over a week to get there, just to get there. Um, and all along the way, where there are no roads, uh, you have to ask yourself this question a lot, right? People are living here, things are happening, uh, no one in this part of the upper Himalayas is, is responsible for the melt that's happening here. It's not their lifestyle that's doing any of the melting. Where, what is, of course this is a beautiful view. Is this landscape? I don't know. It's a view. I don't know if it's landscape. I mean, you know, when you're walking for, for that long, you start to ask yourself these, these questions. The scale of things is very different there. Um, and scale not just in terms of size, but in terms of time and distance. Um, people walk from village to village, so if you're gonna bring something to your aunt, you might have to walk for a day. That's the distance, that's what it takes. Um, it's remarkable to slow down and to revisit some of the more ancestral and raw um, kind of remnant moments that our planet has to offer. Um, and also notice and, and 
I mean, because I say notice because I didn't, I wasn't there to, to, to work with a community. I did end up knowing a lot of them. Uh, but this question of what is landscape, this is a border crossing, you know, these, these moments of, of contrast where you have frame views and interior views, then you have landslides on the other side. And I was there to see a landslide in Longtown Village that buried, um, that buried a village. So, you know, a hanging glacier uh, melted and it fell on top of or filled a valley. So that happens, land is formed. It isn't just deformed or taken away, it's also made new again. This is a process that has been happening for millions and millions and millions and millions of years, well before humans, right? So Longtang was a especially trying and difficult place to think about what is landscape, especially when the landscape is so new. Um, it's baby land. So I started to think of it as baby land because this hanging glacier is there for, yeah, however, uh, however long, uh, tens of thousands of years. And so the, the, the land that is stuck inside the icy core of it is, has not yeah. seen oxygen. It doesn't grow lichen. It has no exposure to our planet. It is, its planet is the ice. And so when the ice melts and this new land falls, the rock is fresh. It's, it's new. I don't know how else to put it. And there is nothing else there. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead and show you. That's what the rock fall looks like. And it's very large, this one. I mean, it's miles deep and miles wide. Um, it's like walking on, I'd have never walked on the moon, but I will say it's like walking on the moon. I mean, it's, there's no soil. It's all made of other rock. Um, and so it's very hard to walk on, in fact. And I start, we started walking across it. Of course, we had to. And, and then your eye picks up this kind of thing. Do you see what this is? What is this? Just say what it is. A shrub, yeah. Okay, but this is planting. This isn't natural. Somebody's hands picked up rocks, put them in a circle, hiked down to where there is soil. Another day. Found a little woody shrub of some kind, brought it up to the landfall, and planted it. So that's landscape. That's land. And it was like, for the first time, it was like, as soon as humans start to move rocks around and bring soil and show care and upkeep and love, it becomes landscape. And this was hugely exciting for me. This was like, because I was seeing baby land. There are no plants, there's no lichen, there's no, it's like sharp and, and rocky. And then they start to find ways across it. Because they, they need to find ways across it. Because they have to bring their donkeys and they still have to go see their aunt. And they start building walls. And they're not, there's not a crew building a wall. There's one person that moves a rock out of the way, and then the next person moves a rock out of the way, and then a few people, and it's actually a perfect height for just sitting with your, you know, backpack leaning. And so making roads, making ways, and planting plants is landscape making at its core, at its beginning. And it's full of hope. And it's full of intention. And therefore, to me, it's full of optimism. It's also just as much a heritage or lineage of our field as Prospect Park might be. And it's very encouraging in, a, in this climate crisis that we're in that villagers respect this land, right? They're really respecting it. I have to move on. Sorry, I can speak for way too long about this, and I haven't, I haven't even started. Ah! 
Um, so, landscape, as I define it in Landscapes of Retreat, is the earth animated by multi-species activity, including layers of habitat from foundations to footprints. Retreat, habitation patterns that meaningfully engage processes of the landscape from climate dynamics to coastal erosion. So that, to me, is a landscape of retreat. Um, it honors the land that's left behind after a major event. That's a word we use in a more bureaucratic setting. But after landscape evolution, after the landscape has evolved in some way, it has evolved through flooding, it has evolved through wave action, it has evolved through any number of events, right? And what happens in this case very often is the tendency to rebuild. What happened in Nepal is the tendency to say, we're not rebuilding. They're not rebuilding. They would not rebuild. Like we can get into that story, but it's in the book. There's too much honor in the change to rebuild. So can we honor this change instead and say, no, not going to rebuild? Is this a natural disaster? Was that a natural disaster? You know, these are questions. This is the Alaska case. Is this a natural disaster? Permafrost, not so permafrost. Again, all of these questions about how we treat plants, where they're growing, why they're where they are, how we interact with the environment that we're in, how we make sense of it. This is absolutely in our profession. And so this question of a natural disaster also becomes very interesting when people don't feel or would even use the word disaster. To them, it was, uh, it was spectacular. It was the earth. Uh, oh, somebody, so, somebody uh, there, um, uh, uh, one of the people we met, he said, in Nepal, the land is loud. I was like, yes, the land is loud. Man-made disaster. So here's a question, and I will, I, uh, I keep thinking that's a watch. Um, is this a natural disaster? Very good. Is this a natural disaster? Yeah. Really? Maybe this is a social disaster. Yeah. Maybe there's just nothing unnatural about this. This is landscape formation. That, that we're not living on it is great because no, no one lost their home and their insurance and everything else that goes along with it, but they also weren't fooled into living in it. These people in Rhode Island were convinced to build in a salt marsh. That's a social disaster. So this is not my framework. I'm just a teacher. There's no such thing as a natural disaster after Katrina, also freely available online. 2006, the denial of the naturalness of disasters is in no way a denial of natural processes. Earthquakes, tsunamis, blizzards, droughts, and hurricanes are certainly events of nature that require a knowledge of geophysics, physical geography, or climatology to comprehend. Whether a natural event is a disaster or not depends entirely on its location. On its location. And that's where we come in, too. Because if you're being asked to do the work that we do as landscape architects in areas that are uh, vulnerable, then you're contributing to potentially uh, a, a future vulnerability, right? So it's very interesting to me that there are these communities that recognize the land they're living with, something is changing, and they choose to move away as a form of honoring or just being in touch with landscape. So there were certain conditions that allowed me to uh, frame, I can't believe it's 4.38. You guys are gonna go at five, right? It's gonna be like five o'clock. Yeah, um, I've been warned. Um, so if you have questions along the way, maybe, I'll just keep talking. Um, so conditions of retreat, after studying a lot of cases, hundreds of cases, and trying to figure out what's the difference between relocation and retreat, how is this a, uh, a retreat case and not a relocation case? First of all, 
also for your studies and also because language matters. Relocation is something that uh, is, is very important. I'm not, it's not an either or situation at all. I'm not against relocation. The difference is how you treat people, how you treat plants, how you treat other, these multi-species relationships, right? So you can relocate a building, but you cannot relocate a family. You can relocate a church, but you cannot relocate a congregation. You can relocate objects, but if you treat breathing organisms like objects, it will not go well. That's it, it's that simple. And so when people decide to retreat, the family decides, the community decides, the congregation decides. They decide to retreat like other beautiful retreat organisms. Salamanders retreat. Fish retreat to lower lake levels just to stay warm. Glaciers retreat. And humans can retreat too. And then we can treat the objects of the environment as elements of relocation. But that difference is important because because, because we should be able to have a voice. We are the ones stuck in between the social and natural disasters, after all. In any case, you can read more about the conditions of retreat um, in, in the book. There are four conditions that re kept repeating in each case and, and it, endlessly fascinating, and it allowed me to kind of delaminate where relocation was and where uh, uh, retreat happened uh, more organically and more in tune. So, at the time, I was also doing a lot of work in Florida with my practice, um, and I was talking about, oh, you know, and I'm working on this research project on retreat, and this was the barrier island we were working on uh, back, back in the 50s. Um, uh, not as much mangrove there anymore, uh, but this natural break happened um, at natural. Again, nobody was hurt, but there was a break because barrier islands are constantly in formation. And so there was this break up here and it took Captiva and it cut it up. And then there was this new part called North Captiva. Um, they did not build a causeway. Um, that North Captiva, this, this, this break caused a very, very deep cut and it was uh, sort of deemed like, okay, if you're gonna live in North Captiva, you're gonna go by boat. Um, fast forward. And this is, this is where we are in South Florida, of course. You can see the break up here. See this? That's the same break. Um, and you see, of course, um, development concretizing. We know that well. Um, there, that's good for me. Um, so uh, I was doing work there, fast forward, and uh, Christy Anders, fantastic restoration ecologist, uh, fantastic woman, uh, I was telling her about the retreat work and sort of my entanglements in it, and she said, oh, I have something to show you. I was like, huh, what do you have to show me? We're going to go to North Captiva. What happened in North Captiva is this site called the Two Sisters. Two Sisters had a home in North Captiva that in that same 1950s blowout, hurricane, lost their home. And of course, was breached, as you saw. And instead of building back their home, they built a dock. That's all they did. They built a dock. This is the Two Sisters dock. And they opened their land to anyone who wants to go. You can camp, you can take your trash with you, it's available, uh, it's beautiful, it's succeeding without anyone trying to stabilize dunes. Um, succeeding meaning in succession, in a process of succession, of plant succession. It's incredible. And so rather than develop their property, rather than concretize their property, rather than uh, sell it, they still come and camp with their grandchildren. They left it as a public amenity. They respected the change. And so that was also hugely uh, inspiring at the time. And so at the, at the scale of the individual, at the scale of a village, at the scale of a river or an entire peninsula, um, we can start to uh, find moments of, this is just sort of like me taking photos of doing research in the field and noticing other people, you know, 
and how they take care of landscapes that they care about and how do you instill care in uh, public landscapes, especially in America, especially on a campus even. Um, how many of you care for the gardens around here or just walk by them? I mean, does this matter? Should this matter in the 21st century? I think it should. We talked about that a little bit in our walk, but in any case. Um, that site, that two sisters site, gave me another moment of hope that there are actually incredible stories, moments, examples, precedents of people adapting to change over time. And it's not hard infrastructure, and it's not scary, and it's not dangerous, and it's not costly. It's, it's adaptive. It's truly adaptive. Um, one of them, uh, which I went to in Japan, is the Niji no Matsubara forest. Uh, hopefully your eyes can kind of trace that forest. It's a pine grove. Um, and that's, of course, where a tsunami took out a village. In the Edo period, though, in the Edo period, so long ago that now the village has this incredible pine forest because their ancestors decided to care for it, and now they care for it. And so rather than building back better, stronger, they, they did this. This is an incredible precedent for landscape architects. This is an incredible place, drawings and all, very deliberate, um, but from a time uh, that you can't, you can't imagine the foresight they had for being good ancestors. I, that was another question somebody asked me when I was in, in, in this part of the world. I said, and it, it, it just kept playing over the way like what is landscape was playing over in Nepal. It was like, what kind of ancestor do you want to be? I had never asked myself that question until it came up. And uh, I think we as landscape architects studying some of the great uh, projects that allow us to thrive in this century need to be better ancestors to the future. Anyways, the forest uh, is incredible. Uh, of course, black pine, it's very, very renowned tree because it, it, it has high, very high plasticity, which means it, it grows fast, so it kind of takes turns and, and corners. That's why it's very well known in bonsai. Most bonsai, if they're gonna be pines, are, are black pines. And so the forest is all twisted from the wind uh, and from hundreds and hundreds of, of years of this uh, development in the, in the sandy, sandy soils uh, of Niji no Matsubara. It's phenomenal. Uh, it brings the community together, literally and physically, emotionally. They, they go in uh, and they, um, I'm not gonna tell you the whole story. You can leave it for the book uh, or the website, obviously. Um, but it's a great story of how it happened of how this artificial forest, yeah, this designed forest has become such um, an important part of everyday life uh, for manifold generations, from kids to grandparents. They take care of it, they have cleanup days, they, they mulch it, they, uh, and it's, you know, it's a very significant act of care because they're taking care of it because they know that their ancestors took care of it and that they have to leave it in a, a condition for, for the next generation. It's really inspiring. And this is the kind of story, I think, that landscape architecture could bring to some of these climate conversations that tend toward uh, quick fixes that are not on the time scale of landscapes or plants. They're too fast. They want big plants, they want them in now, and it's not, it's, it's not, it's actually not helping. It's creating more of a social disaster under the terms of being a natural disaster that we're leaving behind. Um, these would have all started from seed. There was no commercial nursery to spec this forest. So imagine that whole first generation living with it and taking care of it and thinning it and you know, I mean, there's so much imaginary you could bring, you could bring to that. Now, I'm going to contrast that in the last few minutes with a much more contemporary case, which is happening now. Uh, 
in, in Quebec. Somebody's wearing a Quebec shirt, so I'm from Quebec. I'm from this part of the world, and I was also thrilled that the, this case was so powerful and, and, and in a place I love uh, very much. So just to give you a context of where you are in the planet, um, the St. Lawrence River, uh, which in Micmac is the Great Waterway, uh, is, is, a very, is a tidal river. It's the widest river in the world. It, it feels like an ocean. Um, and, it, and of course, it's much more a part of uh, like northern, northern Maine and Vermont than it is a part of the, the rest of Quebec. And so this, this, you know, on a geological level, the whole gas bay is kind of pulling away as the river widens. So as it pulls away, what's happening is the river is moving landward and the land is shifting because landscape changes, right? Landscape changes. Like, we're moving away from Europe right now on this continent because the Atlantic is growing, right? So it's pushing, we're pushing away. Like this building in 100 years will be a little less than a meter further away from Paris. Fact. Landscape moves. So we're landscape architects. So we either decide to fix it or we can embrace some of that movement. Sorry, I'm on a tangent. I'm not gonna tangent anymore. Um, this is the site-ish. Uh, the site, of course, is the whole Cass Bay. Uh, you remember how, how, I mean, it's, it's, you can't, this is also part of the issue with the what is landscape, what is landscape architecture, what is landscape gardening, what is landscape ecology. We're not, we're not gonna landscape architecture the whole coast of the Gas Bay, right? Like nobody wants that, even as designers, right? Sorry, so what, what do you do when the whole thing is shifting and moving and growing and, and the high, high tide is in December, so it's icy and it takes big chunks off? You can design a park, but you have to understand it's a, it's a temporary feature. So parks are supposed to last for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's what we love about parks. So how do you design a park that you know is gonna to start to crumble? I mean, it's a whole other way of thinking about design, right? But you also don't do nothing. We can't do nothing. So this is, this is uh, St. Flavie, which is a town, um, very 1,500 people, it's obviously a very small town, um, and uh, it hugs the river, it hugs the river for all the reasons of industrialization that we know well, uh, non-city environments, like the one we're in, are responsible for helping build city environments. We know that. And so people flock to, or used to flock to, uh, uh, these kinds of uh, non-city environments, in this case, for the timber industry, and of course, to get the timber on the boats and to Quebec City, and then to New York City, uh, for, the great, for the great building of, of our economy. But what it leaves behind, of course, is, a, is a, a series of small towns that are struggling to find their own economies, which are now largely tourist-based. This is a story that you could, all, you could bring a, a copy-paste around the world. Um, and uh, they are, of course, perched on the shore for that same reason that it, it is good for trade. Uh, and of course, the shore is coming ashore. I don't know how else to put that. This is a, a, a good example. That that's that's what's happening, right? And it's happening not fast. It's just there's there's slow risk and there's fast risk. There's episodic risk and there's chronic risk. The episodic risk is that there are storms that take big chunks away. The chronic is simply the slow subsidence and the landward migration of of the water. So you can start to see that here just to give you a better sense of landscape architects of what you're looking at. This is the only uh, road along the gas bay, Route 132. Um, and uh, you have very wide, very uh, rocky shores because it's a tidal river, uh, but you have an escarpment and you have a largely farming uh, and timbering uh, municipality. I met a fantastic an incredible person, Lad Johnson, uh, who I didn't intend to meet. I was trying to meet with foresters, and then I got to know the mayor, the mayor of St. Flavie. None of this would be possible without him. 
Uh, but Lad Johnson, super interesting, is a benthic scientist, which means he studies the bottom of the of the of the ocean, river, underwater floor. He studies the bottom, right? And so this part of the world is really great for him because the tides are so wide that the ocean floor opens up for him, you know, periodically enough that he can study it daily. Of course, he also dives every morning, et cetera. So he had this whole, you know, he just happened to be someone, he was at Yves City, Quebec, and, you know, was trying to find people to talk to, and then sometimes it clicks when you're doing field work and, and you get along with someone. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to follow this water guy for a while and see what happens. <laughs> And he was incredible because he taught me so much about this landscape underwater that I, of course, never really thought of when I was thinking of the landscape of retreat. And then when I was describing my work to him, he said something, again, like the land is loud in Nepal, he said something that stayed with me forever, still inspired the book further. The landscape of retreat is the future in your title. So he's out there studying that, and all of a sudden he's like, right, this former farmland or former former homestead will be underwater. And so all of a sudden for him it was like, wow, I could start studying the processes of, of future benthic environments. It's like, you know, so our worlds collided, they're still colliding, it's fantastic. Uh, so uh, uh, all for collaboration. Um, uh, uh, continued. In any case, a uh, little, little zoom in of, of the area um, to give you also a sense of this, like sometimes it's wide like in St. Flavie, but sometimes it's extremely tight. There you see the edge of the water, the road, uh, and, and someone's home. Um, and so live it, but living with this, of course, felt extremely urgent uh, and as, as landscape architects we also do a lot of research and it's also good to know that um, this has been happening for a long time. It's also interesting to know that in this whole region there aren't any indigenous claims as one, um, as one person put it to me because why would you ever settle in a floodplain? So got that message. Um, and so this is what's happening. And it's happening, uh, like I said, in this chronic way where it's a little bit every day, a little bit every day, a little bit every day. Uh, and they live with it until, boom, uh, 2010, major storm. Uh, and this major storm, which is also what put it on, on my radar, uh, really shook things up uh, in, a, in a major way in St. Flavie uh, that they couldn't really recover from. And so many, many homes were lost, more were damaged, no one was hurt, everybody goes to the local community center and hockey rink. There is kind of remarkable, because uh, there's also an aging community here, but it's such a tight-knit community, and the mayor owns the local bar, so that's how small towns work, and it, and it works really well because people know the names of their neighbors. And that is also a condition of retreat that you have a community in some established way. In any case, it took the federal government, so the, the Canadian government working with the provincial government, almost a decade, almost a decade to release this map. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And anyone in the purple zone could get money for relocation. But it took almost a decade. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's the think big right there. That's the think big. And these people, um, did it on their own way before that map was released. They knew exactly what they were dealing with. They talked to each other. They talked to the mayor. The mayor was incredible in terms of advocacy and how he was able to spend the money that did finally come in. And they moved across the road. Way before, like a year in, way before that map came out. That map was a joke to them. I don't know how much the federal government spent on it, but 
a lot of money. And scientists and universities get involved, and there's the different grants, and they're going to have more meetings, and then they're going to have a meeting about a meeting, and then they're going to, and the map comes out. Meanwhile, this is the landscape of retreats. So when I got there to do the research, before the map came out, I was there probably, I mean, I'm there often, but this research I was there probably in like 2016 or so. Um, they had already started moving across the road, and I said to the mayor, Jean-Francois, so a lot of lots like this, a lot of them, they all start to look the same, but you, you could tell there was a house there, right? First of all, they have incredible recycling area, people bring things, they can, you know, parts of homes and windows and, and old rebar and whatever, and they're, they're all bartering and trading, and it's, it's really remarkable. And I said to Jean-Francois, what are you doing with the land that's left behind? It was that simple. Again, really simple. And he was like, because he was so busy with the relocation. So the community decided to retreat, and it was his job to make the relocation make sense financially, right? But nobody thought about the landscape of retreat. This is, to me, the landscape of retreat. And we are going to have so many of these pixels, from Miami to Maine, popping up. It's been flattened. It's had septic buried in it. It's, some of them obviously still have concrete pads. It's been planted with hydrangeas and other kooky things. But this is. This is the landscape of retreat. So what do you do with the hydrangea and what do you do with the concrete? And actually, what do you do with this flat land? Because this has been flattened, you can tell. So the road is right next to it. So when another storm comes, there's nothing stopping it from continuing to wash out the road. Bye, Ethan, thank you for coming. Um, so uh, we proposed uh, you know, to, to, to work with the community uh, to try a test plot um, and do, uh, we call it, I mean, it's a jardin de bord de mer, which means like garden at the edge of the river. Um, they gave us a test plot. Uh, we started testing things. We made some images. We showed them uh, to the community, et cetera, et cetera. And a couple years later, we had this happening in most of the empty lots. So what is this? Again, 501, really sorry, just leave if you have to leave. Um, while I was there talking to Lad, talking to Jean-Francois, talking to Patricia, who runs an incredible greenhouse, talking to people, and you know, what is landscape? I don't need drawings, right? I just need to be talking to people. And I said, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of river stone that was removed from the shoreline to build homes, and it's in a quarry, just sitting in a quarry. So we just started bringing it back. So we're rewilding with river stone, right? I mean, rewilding doesn't just have to be with seed. So we're bringing back, we're making super simple drawings that the community can read. They do it, we don't do anything. The municipality is doing it. They send us shots. They ask us questions. Patricia's growing a ton of seagrass, which is fun. Uh, school children are getting involved. They send us pictures like this. Is this too big? Is this too small? They go in there. They start to move the soil around. They start to bring back these river stone and plant it. And so really what we ended up doing after a couple of years is making this little booklet we call How to Grow a Shoreline which is essentially a recipe. If you have this much stone or this much plant or this much soil or, you know, how, how do you cook with it um, and get everybody involved? And so it's not, I mean, I hope it's landscape architecture. I, I think it's closer maybe to landscape gardening. I'm not sure. Whatever it is, we are, we are collaborating from afar. I go every summer, but we collaborate from afar, we, we share as much as we can, and we're having a great time doing it because there are so many sites. So now we have donations coming in because uh, we are trying to advocate to have a little bit more funding for some of it. Um, donations are coming in also uh, just of nursery stock, and it's, it's growing up, and it's providing uh, at least some attenuation 
and more importantly, there's a, a, a vision that people have there that, that something can come of um, what was there. The piles move, this is right after installation, you can tell, um, but they're starting to move, especially with the winter, there's a very, a lot of snow, so once the snowpack um, melts, the, the, they're taking on kind of all kinds of different forms, which is fine, right? I mean, nobody's gonna go back and tidy it up or anything. And uh, we made them big signage and whatnot, and, and every summer, um, uh, we, we, uh, we work with the municipality and the school, and that's the one. They just sent me this one, so I thought I would show you. Um, and we're excited. We're excited about the opportunity, and we're also excited that we, um, my team and I, and also everyone there, that it's possible to do this even though they don't have a lot of money. They're working underneath the federal government without any kind of um, regulation.